Amen. Please be seated. You know, you probably have gathered that there's a theme to today's service, and it is to give thanks. Uh, from the prayers and the songs and uh, the words of praise. You know, the truth is that after hearing Karen's opening, as she spoke briefly about Psalm 90, after her reading Psalm 100, after Kathy's testimony, we probably could go home completely satisfied. Yeah. <laughs> but but I, I can't, I can't, I can't. Uh, let things end there. I have, to, I have to share a few words because we come to this time of the year and for some of us, we wait all year long for Thanksgiving. Turkey is one of my favorite meals. I love turkey and stuffing and mashed potatoes and gravy. And I know that in other traditions and cultures, there may be other foods. I know that the pilgrims uh, probably didn't have turkey uh, as their main course. But for me, I love it. And this week, we'll be gathering with family and friends to celebrate this holiday. Now, it doesn't happen everywhere in the world. Does, do you celebrate Thanksgiving in Honduras? No, no. And there are lots of countries where they don't really celebrate. It is really a, a traditional American holiday. Even in our country, there's some controversy over when it started and what exactly took place. We've romanticized the story of the pilgrims and the Native Americans. It probably didn't look like we've pictured it in the movies. Nevertheless, this idea of pausing to give thanks to God finds its root in our particular history as a nation founded upon Judeo-Christian principles. You have to look no further than Psalm 100 to find this foundational idea. It begins with the words, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. And the truth is, we can celebrate that and we lift that up as a psalm of thanksgiving, and yet this is our call for everyday life. That when we wake up in the morning, we should enter into the courts of God with thanksgiving and praise. Here in this country, we have much to be thankful for. God has blessed us as a nation. Oh, we aren't perfect. But as we noted last week, we are free to worship without fear. We can gather here in our homes, in our communities to pray and to serve God. The freedoms we enjoy are many. The country was built upon this idea that you can dream dreams and you can chase after those dreams. In one generation, you can go from poverty to plenty. Just ask many of our immigrants who came here from Europe looking for hope and looking for possibilities, and they have found that. We are blessed, which brings us back to Psalm 100. And this morning, I'd like to take just a few moments to reflect upon what it says as we come to our Thanksgiving celebrations once again. You know, Psalm 100 is a familiar psalm to many. It's a Thanksgiving psalm, and as such, I want to break it down and suggest four things for us to consider as we come to our holiday tables. If we want to do Thanksgiving right, then we need to come with a joyful heart. We need to make space for God at our tables. We need to reflect upon how much He loves us and be deliberate be deliberate in thanking God. I'll talk about these things in just a minute, but before we do that, I need to set the record straight on what Thanksgiving is not about. Because, you see, in our culture, in our day and time, we often get confused. It isn't just a, a day off from work, the beginning of a long weekend, or worse yet, the day to get ready for Black Friday. <laughs> it's not primarily about turkey and football, or even going to grandma's house. Now, you can make a point that we can be thankful for each of these things. Well, except for maybe Black Friday. <laughs> but over the years, many of us have incorporated them into our holiday celebrations, and it's often become more about these traditions than actually taking time to be thankful. Let me just say this, I have faithfully attended the annual Stonington Westerly football game for the last eight years. I remember my first year going and I saw uh, Father Ray from St. Pius there and, uh, and I said to him, I said, Father Ray, I, I, I'm new at this. I said, you probably have people from both Stonington and Westerly, how do you manage it? And he said, well, every quarter I go to the other sideline. <laughs> 
And I said, okay, you give me the key to celebrating Thanksgiving in Westerly or Stonington. I, I have to say that I went to Black Friday once and I almost got trampled and I said, I'm never going again. One year, I made Thanksgiving a real family affair. I, I trekked down to Kentucky to be with my parents and my two brothers. It was a special time. We actually celebrated on Wednesday so that I could get back home to celebrate with my family and my mother-in-law up here. You know, it's all good, these traditions, these things that we do. You see, all of these things can be a part of what makes it special, a special day. Because at its very heart, Thanksgiving is first and foremost about cultivating a glad heart, to be thankful for the things in our lives, the people in our lives. God wants us to be joyful and thankful for these things. And so often we take them for granted. We wake up in the morning and we just go about our day and we never stop to think about the important people the important things in our lives. It's only when tragedy strikes or some difficulty comes up that we, we actually stop and we begin to pray and say, thank you, God. Be with grandpa or be with my mom or be with my friend who is struggling right now. But God wants us to be thankful. The Apostle Paul says in his letter to the Philippians, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice God calls us to be joyful and thankful people. And thanksgiving is all about pausing to recognize your blessings and to rejoice over them and to thank the one who is responsible for all of them. You know, the early settlers in this country had been through a horrific year. And yet, as they came to the end of the harvest season, they had reason to give thanks. They had made it through the year and saw God's providence. President Abraham Lincoln was presiding over a divided nation that was at war. And yet he paused to proclaim a day of national thanksgiving. You know, sometimes I think it's in the midst of our greatest troubles that we really need to stop, pause, and give thanks. And remember how God has been with us, how God continues to be with us, and how God will carry us through those days. Even in the worst of times, people have been able to rejoice over the fact that they had a loving God that had promised to be with them who would not let them go. You know, some of us in this past year have experienced loss and sorrow and pain in the past year. It may be hard to come to the table because there's going to be an empty seat there. Yet we can be glad because of the memories that we've had and the love that has been shared and the hope we have in Christ of an eternity, and that we'll see them again. It's been a tough year financially for some who have lost their jobs with rising prices, the uncertainty of the future. Maybe there won't be much on the table this year, but we can be glad because God is with us and He's promised that He holds the future. And as Christians, we have so much to be joyful about. And so, Thanksgiving, as we come to the table, we want to be able to bring that sense of joy, God's joy. Number two is this. Let me ask you, do you include God at your table? Last year, I was invited to preach at the Watch Hill Chapel, and there was quite a crowd, and, and it struck me that, that we don't, in many of our Protestant churches, have a Thanksgiving Day worship service. And I wondered, why not? Well, who's going to cook the turkey? <laughs> No, no, there, there probably is a reason. You know, there's a reason for everything. I remember when I was in Boston working in the homeless shelter, the senior center there, uh, there was this one man who came in every day, traveled from South Boston, and he'd come in, and, uh, and one day he was sitting there, and he said, you know, young man, I want to tell you this. There's a reason for everything. I thought, wow. And then he said, it may not be a good reason, but there's a reason and I've thought about that over the years of, of, of the fact that, that there are a lot of things that we do or we don't do and there's probably a reason for it. But I think maybe part of the reason in our Protestant churches especially that, that we didn't have a Thanksgiving service was that there was an expectation that Thanksgiving was going to be done in our homes as part of the celebration. Time was set apart to praise God and thank Him as you came to the table but over time, I think many of us have forgotten that. 
it's been more important to get the mashed potatoes on the table and the buns out of the oven than it is to actually stop, maybe to read a proclamation by our president or to say a prayer. We read in verse 2 of Psalm 100, Come before His presence with singing. Being thankful is all about praising and worshiping God. You know the story in the scriptures of the ten lepers being cleansed is a perfect example of, of what many of us have fallen into. We may not have suffered with leprosy, but we have all been blessed by God. Our sins have been forgiven, and at the very least, our day of thanksgiving should include a word of praise and worship over what God has done for us. Now, no one wants to be identified with the nine ungrateful lepers. We all tend to gravitate towards that one who came back and thanked Jesus. But if we were to be honest, there are many times in our lives when we have felt God's blessing where we did not go to God and say thank you. The big raise at work. Maybe that long answered prayer that our first grade teacher would be removed from our presence uh, But we want to be the one, this Thanksgiving, every Thanksgiving, the one who stops to thank God and worship Him. And I would encourage you that if you want to do Thanksgiving right, you will include a short time of Thanksgiving and worship to God. The third thing we we give thanks on Thanksgiving because we have a personal relationship with God. He knows us and we know Him. Verse 3 says that we are His people and the sheep of His pasture. You know, I don't know if you've ever been to a a professional golf tournament. I know in Hartford for many years they had the classic and they would have people come in and and there's a story told one time, you know, as as you go on the golf course they have ropes uh, and all the spectators are behind the ropes and the the golfers are in between. Well, this one time uh, Jack Nicholas uh, is said to have been at the height of his career and he was on the 18th hole and he was getting ready to shoot and all of a sudden this little boy comes running through and, and everybody's in a panic because they said, oh, you know, parents, control your children. Who's this boy? It was Jack's son, little Jack. <laughs> and he came in and he just hugged his father, jumped into his outstretched arms. To everyone else, Jack Nicholas was the golfer, but to that little boy, he was his daddy. At the most basic level, we can rejoice because God knows us and loves us. The psalmist says, who am I that God considers me and made me just beneath the angels? We are blessed and for that we can rejoice. He is our Abba, Father. He's invited us into his family and what's more is that he adopted us and made us join heirs with Jesus, the apostle tells us. We have access to everything he has to offer. You see, God isn't just an abstract figure for us. He loves us and he knows our name. And if that isn't a reason to give thanks, then nothing is. And finally, thanksgiving is really about saying thank you. This seems like such a simple point, but it's so simple that we often miss it. Just like Christmas becomes Xmas, Thanksgiving can be passed over as if we don't purposely offer thanks to God. There's a funny story told a number of years ago. You know, New York City has a reputation for being a tough place. Well, in a crowded New York City uh, bus a man got up and offered his seat to a lady and the woman fell over and fainted. (laughs) Because how does that happen? When does that happen? She couldn't believe the man was being so gracious. And, And when they got her up and everything, she looked at the man and she said, thank you. And then the man fell over and passed out. You know, we live in a world where... People don't say thank you anymore or you're welcome. Now maybe they do, maybe you've trained that in your household with your children or grandchildren, but just walking along the street, it is rarer and rarer. It's as if we forgot the simple things of life to say thanks when we are blessed. And maybe it's because 
Maybe it's because we're so inundated with stuff and things. You know, I read that garages became a popular addition to homes in the early 1950s. And normally it was a one-car garage. Now you see new houses being built and they're adding two and three-car garages. There are storage sheds. There are she sheds. There are, are extra space built into our homes in the attics and basements so that we could store all the stuff we have. And, and I know I'm guilty. Lori and I have been talking about the fact I need an office at home. We've got to build an office in the basement. Well, we were looking at a room we have upstairs. We don't really use those rooms. And she said, can you fit all your stuff in this room? <laughs> I said, I don't think so. <laughs> I'm guilty. Just look at my office now. That's what Lori's talking about. How can I fit all that stuff in any room at home? The problem is, is that too often, the more we have the less thankful we become. The more blessings we have in our lives, we begin to take them for granted. And Thanksgiving Day provides us the perfect opportunity to stop and take stock of all of our blessings. At the very least, we can be thankful for our health. We can be thankful for another day. We can be thankful for our family and friends. We can be thankful for our memories. There's a, there's a story told about author uh, Rudyard Kipling. And over time, he became a very wealthy man. His writing and other things paid off. Uh, and a very cynical reporter. I don't know, is that true? Are there cynical reporters? Yeah, probably. A cynical reporter found him one day and said, Mr. Kipling, it's been discovered that you make as much as $100 for every word you write. And the reporter pulled out a $100 bill, handed it to Mr. Kipling and said, could you give me a $100 word? And Mr. Kipling folded the bill, put it in his pocket and said, thanks. <laughs> Surely, thanks is a $100 word. It is so valuable. And when you couple that with a God who gives us all that we have, whether we deserve it or not, the God who has given us life and breath, the God who's offered His only Son, Jesus Christ, as an atonement for our sin, the God who, who watched His Son suffer on the cross and die, the God who raised Him from the dead as the first fruits of all who fall asleep, the God who has said, if you believe in Me, if you trust in Me, then you will have eternal life. Surely, to say thanks to Him is not too much. This year, I'm honored to be preaching at the Watchill Chapel again. I look forward to being in worship that day. I found that it provides a great start to my Thanksgiving. And I have to tell you that the reason, well, last year, when the person who was looking for the speaker came and interviewed me, I hope she's not watching, <laughs> one of the things she said to me was is that, that, that this is a very important service because we ask people to give sacrificially so that we can share with the helping agencies in our community. And so you're not afraid to ask people to give, are you? Now, don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to give. And I said, well, no, I, I, I'm comfortable, especially with such good causes. And so she said, well, then okay, we'd like to have you come and speak because it is a day of giving thanks. And so I, I spoke, and, and it was a big crowd, and it was very exciting, and it and allowed me to kind of go off the rest of the day to, to hit the, the football game, and then to go on and, and celebrate with family, to offer prayers around the table, and, and to just relax and reflect on the day afterwards. Well, she gave me a call earlier this year, and she said, I want you to know that last year, we had the biggest offering ever on Thanksgiving, and so we'd like to invite you back again. <laughs> That's a lot of pressure, though, i got to tell you. But the point is, my message was about being thankful and recognizing that all we have comes from God. And when that's the message, then people respond. And so I want to encourage you that as you go to your tables this year, as you prepare for whatever else is part of your celebration, to do these four things, to rejoice in what God has given you, to invite God into your, your, your Thanksgiving celebrations, to thank Him and to praise Him. And when you do, this will be as special a day as you've ever had. So give thanks and make this a true day of Thanksgiving 
Amen. We're going to close our worship out today.